some teams that we need to worry about. The Milwaukee Bucks, without Chris Middleton and with Doc Rivers and Darvin Ham, the Bucks, in my opinion, are at least on DEFCON 2. Like the Cuban Missile Crisis in real life was a DEFCON 2. So I'm, I'm putting them at Cuban Missile Crisis right now. <laughs> Tell me who they hire for head coach next, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure Doc Rivers isn't going to have that job by the end of this year, which is ridiculous. You because... think he's getting fired midseason? They're giving they're their coach Why two not? seasons. I mean, he has, so far he has a negative record with the Bucks. He has lost more games than he has won. Adrian, when a, what was the record when Adrian Griffin was fired? It was Dude, like 30 and lost... 12. They had, like, not lost. That. They were one of the best yeah. teams in the NBA, record-wise. Obviously, it like, was, like, 30 and line. 18 or some shit like that. Yeah. So, like, uh, that's what... Nick, you were going to say something. I want to let you speak first before... No, I all I was going to... I was just going to say, like, Scott Brooks. I was just, like, trying to throw out names. Like, I don't yeah. know. That's all I was thinking. This is what Gene frustrates Boyden. me. The Bucks under Adrian Griffin were definitely going to make the playoffs, and they had clearly shown throughout the first 40 games of the season or whatever it was that they could win games. Like, they could win a, a significant, a non-negligible amount of games. And, yeah, you know, maybe you're, you've got clear flaws, but you are clearly capable of winning a lot of games. And going into the playoffs with that team versus the version of the Bucks that we've seen under Doc Rivers, where he has a negative record and they are losing more games than they're winning, it's like... Hmm, let's think for a second. Would I rather be the team under the coach that was winning a lot of games, or would I rather be the team under the coach that's losing a lot of games? Hmm, let me put on my thinking cap for just a second and, and come to the conclusion that, oh, wait, Doc Rivers can do it. He, he wasn't able to do it with any of the other teams he coached except for the Celtics, but he might be able to do it with us. And here we are, running on the rat wheel again, to saying, hmm, is Doc Rivers going to be here by the end of the year? Yes. I also think that for the first time in my objective life, like I say life, he hasn't been in the league my entire life, but viewing Giannis, this season is the first time that the something might happen with him going somewhere else. Shit is real. I think this is the first time. Like you could argue that it's been real in the past. And that's why they did the Drew Holiday thing. Cause they're like, no, we're committed to winning. Cause he always, it was like clockwork. The guy every two years would do like a fucking Vanity Fair feature where he would say some really cryptic shit or be very direct and be like, I will be here for as long as they're trying to win championships. And then within a week of that coming out, they either trade for Drew Holiday or they trade for Damian Lillard, right? So that's, that's indication that there has been some, not friction, but there's been kind of something, there's some embers there in the past. This year is the first time that I'm actually like, no, like if, because it's not at this point, there's nothing you can do with the roster. I don't know. Maybe there is, right? We'll see. Never say never. But it's like this is clearly the core that they want to stick to because, or at least that Giannis wants to stick to. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. If we're body body language policing this, you know, Jacob doesn't seem to think that he and Dame get along. I don't know. I haven't, I have no idea. I haven't seen any of that myself. But um, I would, I would very much believe that if they flame out, and like, God forbid, this is such a stupid thing for me to even put in the universe because this isn't going to happen. But like, God forbid they end up in the plan or something like that, because then I think it's going to be a real. And the worst part about it is this isn't the worst part. It's not really how I mean it. Dog, Oklahoma City has like the treasure chest for a guy like him. And like, don't let that shit happen. Holy shit, please don't let that shit happen. You want to talk about Kobe and Shaq, don't give Shay that motherfucker. Milwaukee would, like, want a guy or two, for sure. By the way, Oklahoma City has a lot of that. But if we're just talking about picks, Oklahoma City could give up 15 first swaps, unprotected, whatever the fuck, and still have, like, 40 picks left over. You know what I mean? And so we've been kind of, say we, it's just been me, kind of, like, shitting on Sam Presti, because it's like, hey, man, either piss or get off the pot. Like, stop being a fucking little freak with all of these draft picks like do something with them it. right and it's like you can just you know it's like uh what was that show um uh, my strange addiction or hoarders whatever the fuck it was motherfuckers would would have like uh like brats dolls like in their couch cushions they're like i just can't this is that's this guy that's sam presti but with draft picks and he just won't do anything with them and then i'm gonna be the one who has to eat it when he's like, oh, actually, I am going to cash in, and it's Giannis. And guess what? I could still go get another Giannis if I wanted to because of how much shit I have left over. Don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. 
Bring, 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 bring. In my head canon, it's been Luca this whole time. That yeah, was for sure. That end up in OKC. But honestly, I mean, Giannis is older. He's about to be 30. But like, in terms of bit-wise, SGA and Luca at the same time. Did I cut you guys off? I wasn't looking at the screen. I did not yes. realize you guys were doing this. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. You're the hold music. Bring, 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 bring. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to cosplay as Pat Riley right now. Uh, y'all, y'all can, the panel... Can, this can be the Bucks way. owner group, the the Bucks ownership group. Uh, I'm seeing y'all aren't having the amount of success that you need. I got a, I got a ripe superstar ready to be traded for you, and you got a guy that I've been been eyeing for a while now. What do you say I trade your Jimmy Butler for Damian Lillard straight up? <laughs> that's something. Whoa, could you fucking imagine if that's how it, and just to break the, sorry, this is a good bit. Maybe we should do this mental exercise. Could you imagine if the, first of all, Milwaukee says no, but could you imagine if that's how Miami actually ended up getting Damian Lillard is they parted ways with Jimmy <laughs> Butler? Holy that. shit. That would be insane. That would be so fucking funny. The money, but work? Milwaukee says no to that, right? I think, I, I think both, I think both of those guys are at the point in their careers where Trading one for the other, both teams would kind of be like, you know, it's it's more or less a lateral move where like, I'm not sure Milwaukee gets significantly better with Jimmy Butler and I'm not sure the Heat gets significantly better with Damian Lillard. So I think both are kind of like, yeah, we could try this to throw something else at the wall and see if it sticks. But at this point, we're probably just gonna run with this guy until he's moving on to the like, dark years of like their Russell Westbrook years where they're just going from team to team and not doing a whole lot. Well, plus it's like, if I'm Milwaukee, what's the, what are the two things that we don't have right now? Stuff and capital, right? We spent all our capital to get Drew Holiday and then like the little remaining shit that we had to involve like five teams in order to even facilitate the Damian Lillard trade. So that's another reason why Oklahoma City in this instance would make so much sense because it, it's almost like when Brooklyn did this and then they just got, they replenished their cupboard by just selling selling the team for parts. You know what I mean? So they ended up getting all their swaps back from Houston. Not all of them, but that's how it ended up happening, right? Something like that. And so if I'm Milwaukee, it needs to be a, a capital rich team, you know, with, with the picks. And that's Oklahoma City right now. Speaking of capitals, Indianapolis, the Pacers, not looking good. Uh, we didn't get perfect DEFCON ratings from all you guys, so um, before we move on to, to the Pacers, I do want to give you a chance to say either a DEFCON rating or a scary movie. Giannis is Florence Pugh in Midsummer. Alex. <laughs> what am favorite. I doing? What am I doing? How scared are you? How scared for the Bucks are you on a scale of uh, five to one or something Halloweeny? Uh. I mean, I'm not, I'm not scared because it's like, it's like you go into a, like a cheesy, like slasher film and you know exactly what you're getting. So like, why would you be scared? It's a cheesy slasher film. It's like the Bucks. Yeah. They're, they're good. Do I think they're like legitimate actually has a chance to beat Boston in a seven game series? Do I think that they have a serious chance to do that? No, they're a cheesy slasher horror film. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy watching them. I love Chris Middleton. I love Giannis. Dame's fun when he's being an aggressive shooter and and knocking down his threes from 500 feet away from the basket. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy it. But am I going to give it an Oscar? No. No. The uh, Pacers are losing the race to keep up with the old version of themselves, especially Tyrese Halliburton who appears totally lost without the whole offense running through him. I mean, his stats were outrageous last year. They are outrageous in the opposite direction this year. He is averaging right now in their four games in which they lost three, 14 points, 4.8 rebounds, and 5.3 assists. Not 15.3 like you might think because it's Tyrese Halliburton, but 5.3 shooting 33.9 from the floor, 26.5 from three, and 63% from the line. He can't even get a bucket to go in at the free throw line. What is happening in Indianapolis? Are they just like the Kings of last year where they're really good and then the league catches up and they got to adjust? Like, what's going on here? Can, can I take point here for a second? Yeah. Okay, okay. Rick Carlisle won a championship with the Dallas Mavericks in 2011. Props to him. He is a legendary coach. I have a lot of respect for Rick Carlisle. I think the Pacers offense is is a ton of fun and he's done a lot with that personnel. But that being said, we are in the year 2024. 
And if you look at NBA defenses right now, every single defense in the league is bringing help somewhere. Like, you're going to have to help off of somebody. And I understand like with the Pacers, you're like, well, who do you help off of? It's like, well, you know, you got to pick somebody. At some point, there's going to be players on the floor that you got to help off of. And you watch the Paolo Bancaro 50 bomb. The dude was playing out of his mind. I understand that. I think Paolo Bancaro is an incredible player. They didn't, they didn't double him. They didn't double him at all. And he drops 50 on you. Pacers almost won, but they didn't. And they gave up, you know, what was the final score of that game? You know, they gave up a ton of points. What I don't understand is, does Rick Carlisle seriously think that the Pacers genuinely could win a championship by only playing defense one-on-one and not bringing help? Like, because if so, to me, that's a little, I, you know, I'm not an NBA coach, so what do I know? But to me, that seems like cognitive dissonance. Because the best defenses in the NBA that win championships are helping somewhere. Every team's going to bring help somewhere. But it seems to me like Rick Carlisle genuinely thinks, like, we don't, guys, come on, we got a shot. If our offense is good enough, we got a shot. It's like, no, defense still does matter. You can argue the extent to which defense matters in today's modern NBA, but it still does matter. You don't win a championship unless you're a good defense. So I'm just confused by the fact that we saw it last year, like the Pacers, yeah, they made the Eastern Conference Finals. Hats off to them, fun team. But this defense has to evolve at some point, right? Like they got to try something different at some point, right? Yeah, I also feel like their defensive personnel. I don't, I don't think they have to be as bad of a defensive team as they are. Right. It really seems like they're just choosing to be a lot of the time. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I completely agree. That's why it's frustrating. Where I'm like, this is definitely a schematic choice of like yeah we're not going to bring help we're playing everybody straight up it's like you don't need to you have good like there's good defensive personnel Mm -hmm. there's at least guys who are not turnstiles on defense like we know pascal siakam can defend we know uh neesmith can defend we know nemhard can defend they may not be able to defend everybody but they can defend so why are they as bad as they are miles turner jaris walker Jairus Walker. I don't know. So how worried are we about the Pacers on a scale of uh, Jason to Freddy Krueger? Or I think the concern is more, I guess it is directly connected, but I think it's entirely, they go as Tyrese Halliburton does, and they've sucked because he's sucked. And there is a little bit of concern that maybe that pre-All-Star break stretch where he looked like arguably a top 10 player in the NBA was a flash in the pan and that's not how good he actually is. Obviously, there's injury stuff factoring, and that may be the reason he's not there is because of that, but one way or the other, pretty much since then, he has not looked the same. And it's both like he's afraid to shoot, and when he does, it doesn't look like he has much confidence in it. So I'm worried to the extent that, if you look at the teams right now, like obviously the OKC Thunder, they're undefeated right now, they're shooting 28% from three. So it's like, it doesn't matter for them. The Pacers, right now, they're shooting 31% from three so far this season. They're going to be better when the shots start falling. Right now, their issues are very much probably variance-based. Once the variance starts to swing back up, they'll probably be all right. But they are not a team like, you know, even even the Bucks. it's like they're shooting 33.3% from three. It's like you have to have something else to rely on when the shots aren't falling. And I think that's where the Pacers' struggles are coming from, is like, they're a spray it out to shooters team. But when the shots aren't falling, they're gonna look really bad because they don't have defense to fall back on. They don't have other things, like they, yes, they have Pascal Siakam, who's definitely more of an inside the art guy that they can kind of fall back on. But is that enough to buoy your, your entire offense at this point in his career? Probably not. So I'm just wondering what what is it that the Pacers look to fall back on? because they have to establish something. They can't rely on just three-point shooting. It'll get them to a good amount of wins. It might get them to the Eastern Conference Finals if the chips fall the right way. But I don't know. I'm just wondering what what is the next evolution for the Pacers? Sending uh, Rick Carlisle to the Bucks in a trade for Doc Rivers and a first-round pick. Just see what happens. A little Eastern Conference mix-up. Uh, sure. To me, Luka's more like well, Sauron. <laughs> or not Luca, Victor uh, Wemby. Wemby's more like yeah. Uh, yeah, Wemby's the tower. tower. 
Yeah. yeah big I don't know. Nobody's covered. rooting against him. Everybody's yeah. just but, enamored with the guy. I mean, I was rooting for well, Sauron yeah. in the Lord of the Rings. I guess it's more of a situation of like, you know, this thing is coming to destroy us all, and we must right. assemble with the power oh, of friendship and more of an. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. Again, haven't seen Lord of the Rings, but I do have a dad who's seen them nonstop, so I know a lot of it. Uh, I feel like, isn't Frodo, like, he's got an underdog category to him, because he's just a little guy. And, like, and he's Victor a hobbit Webb and Yama, Victor Webb and Yama like... is the opposite of that. Yeah, but that's, I'm talking about, like, narratively, not, like, structurally, like, physically what the guy is. No, you know, because Luca's, like, fucking like, six, seven. He gets the narratives. Cause he's <laughs> this not, is a like, good time for me to go to the bathroom. Before we exit the DEF CON slash Spooky's Halloween segment, let's uh, go through these clippers right quick because while they are 2 and one they were sued recently by Kawhi's personal trainer who gave Kawhi a two-year recovery window for an ACL tear. And they were like, yeah, that's not acceptable. That's ridiculous. This is not the 80s. His career isn't threatened by an ACL tear. Just get him back on the court. And... Uh, that's that's kind of like Kawhi suing the team himself because as far as I understand him and his personal trainer are like mega close he even said I believe in these court documents that the Clippers did a form of recruiting Kawhi through his trainer so maybe some uh fringe uh what's what's the, it's not collusion it's it's the NBA fun, fun word for operating like it's free agent season when it's not what the fuck is it tampering tampering, tampering. fringe tampering lawsuit by the Clippers but the good news is the wall works the big wall in the in the Intuit Dome apparently works. Uh, Suns got real shook up by the free throw line, or excuse me, at the free throw line. Real quick, how much are we panicking about the Clippers? Because we got to move on to some more positive news. So I would say I'm like DEFCON 5 with the Clippers because there's the Clippers have a piece that I think no other team has. It's like, it's like, I'm trying to think of it a good example. Let's say you like, committed like some crazy white collar crime and you're sentenced to like life in prison uh i say that because i wouldn't say this for like if you committed murder or something like that but there's I a piece caught, but... there, there's a piece in committing a white collar crime and getting life in prison where it's like ah you got me like there's nothing i can do i'm going to be here for like the rest of my life <laughs> there's a piece in that and i think with the clippers it's like it's like they tried to they tried to get away with it they really did where they traded all their assets to get Kawhi, get Paul George on the same team, and it didn't work. And now they don't have any assets. And it's like, you know what? We got James Harden. We'll see what we can do. But like, we're screwed. We're screwed. We got nothing. And I think they're, that's why I would have them at DEF CON 5. Cause like, there's nothing they can do. They could trade Kawhi. They could trade James Harden. They might get some assets back, recoup the treasure chest a little bit. And then, you know what? not a bad idea but regardless of what they do they got this sick new this sick new arena that's looking pretty nice and they have no draft picks and they're just like you know what we'll see what we can do we're probably going to be pretty bad if Kawhi's is never healthy again and he sues the crap out of us but oh well we'll see what we can do and there's peace <laughs> in that there's peace in that and they're also fine so far like they're two and one they have uh like a what is it? Uh, 4.2. Like, they've been fine. James Harden's look good. It's like, meh. Yeah, the big three of James Harden, Ivanka Zubac, and Norman Powell. I mean, those guys are putting up a combined, like, 74 points a game or something like that. Zubac getting 14 boards and four assists a game. Harden getting eight rebounds and 12 assists a game, if I'm being nice and rounding up. I mean, like, what the hell? These guys should not be 2-1 and one based on their roster composition and situation. And yet they are, so... I see what you're saying. Very little reason to worry, but they do make the list because of the news. All right, moving on. I'm good. I guess this... I'm the only one who had takes about the Clippers. I don't know. No, you're just right. There's nothing else right. to say. You're just no right. <laughs> uh, calling this segment sort of the, the inverse of the DEF CON slash scared segment. This is a premature extrapolation. We got some guys, or rather some teams and one guy who are doing a little bit better than expected to start the year. And we're gonna see if this is uh, something that can sustain itself for the rest of the year. I is this real or fake? I premature extrapolate. That's definitely what I said. That's what he said. What did he say? Extrapolate. Extrapolate, fuck! Not excavate or whatever you just said. <laughs> I think he said excapulate, which is not a word as far it's as not. I know. 
I butchered it. Let's just move on. <laughs> That's staying in. Uh, the Cavaliers yeah. are four and zero. Oh. They have the third ranked offense in terms of points per game. The number one field goal percentage in the NBA. The number two three point percentage. Is this real? Are the Cavs actually this good? Evan Mobley been playing out of his mind. Developed real nice. Darius Garland seems to be at least somewhat back to form. And uh, new coach, new look. Cavaliers are they uh, contenders? Is this a real? threat in the Eastern Conference, or is this just a team with some continuity having a hot start? You know, Rudy, there are many people, many such cases of people saying that all of the credit here would have to go to our favorite Silicon Valley lizard, Kenny Atkinson. Now, this does not answer your question, but I'm just very excited that Kenny Atkinson is a head coach again, and that he's coaching a team that looks pretty good. Here's a take I haven't gotten to get off yet. Again, does not answer your question. I am genuinely, and this isn't cope, like, oh, fuck, I wish I had this guy. Like, of course I do, but, like, I'm just, I, I mean this exactly how I'm about to say it. I'm genuinely happy for Cavs fans that Donovan Mitchell is their guy because he's just, like, an awesome dude and is also, like, an awesome player. Like, he is the same amount of good as a dude as he is as a player. You know what I mean? Like, he just fucking rules. And that's such a great guy to be the number one dude that you're rooting for. So I'll give the ball to somebody else to actually answer the fucking question, but shout out to the Silicon Valley lizard, Kenny Atkinson, and shout out to Cavs fans for having Donovan Mitchell to root for. I think this team is like genuinely just good. They were genuinely good last year. It's just, you know, sometimes the cookie crumbles the wrong way and guys get hurt and you're not able to establish continuity through like having everyone available for the entirety of the season. But this year it's like they got the full off season. They got the like Donovan Mitchell question out of the way of like, Will he, won't he? It's like, yeah, he's sticking around. He's He loves it there. And you, you got your guy, like Nick said. And Evan Mobley's starting to do things. Darius Garland's starting to do things again. Uh, you, have, you have what you need. Like, there are certainly moves around the edges, but this is a team that, like, has a chance. They've got the pieces to where you get your foot in the door and then you've got the puncher's chance. Like, you just got to get into the ring. And they've got the knockout power. Pretty much ever since he went there, it's been like, okay, the X factor is Evan Mobley. If Evan Mobley develops his offensive game, we're having different conversations about them. Um, he's looked awesome. He's looked decisive. It goes beyond the three point shot, which was the big thing everyone was talking about with him. But like, it's, I was surprised because he's shown flashes of the ability to do it, but how well he attacks off of the dribble as a big man is really impressive. Has a lot of really good touch in the floater range. Um, he's scrawny, but he's not really too afraid of contact. And then the jump shot has looked somewhat real to this point, at least relative to what it's been before. So uh, if Evan Mobley keeps this up, I think I would put them in the contender category. Uh, Cause for me, the last couple of years, they've been like just, just outside of that conversation. Um, I would still like to see Darius Garland go somewhere else because I think Cleveland could be better off with a different type of player than Darius just because you already your main guy is a small guard who you want to dribble and pass a lot and shoot a lot, obviously. But they've got plenty of talent. And if Evan Mobley is like this good, like borderline second option to this point over Darius Garland, at least in shot attempts. I don't know what the stats look like, but that's what I would go off of my eye test from the two games I've watched. Uh, dude's just fucking great. And that's everything. It, it is everything for them that he is great offensively. If he's B plus Anthony Davis, you have that plus Donovan Mitchell, that can take you really goddamn far, especially with a really good complete roster around it. No, yeah, I believe in the Cavaliers as a legitimate fringe contender at this point. I mean, they've been kind of pushing that boundary for a while, but they've been held back, in my opinion, by Grizzlies legend, John Blackwicker staff, Pistons legend. I could see a world where maybe if one of the Jays tweaks an ankle or something like that, they sneak into the finals, you know? It's very well plausible, and that'd be very good for Cleveland to even make a finals appearance without LeBron on the team. What about another Eastern Conference sleeper, the Orlando Magic? We've talked about Paolo Bencaro a couple of times prematurely before the premature extrapolation segment already. He is averaging, what does that say, 28, 9, and 6. I'm sure the efficiency is great too, because that's his sort of game. Right now, he's taking out the, the inefficient uh -huh. jumpers and kind of put it into a... Uh, more, more inside and outside type stuff, you know, he's doing less in between game. Looks really strong out there. Like I know a couple weeks ago, 
Jacob passively said on a video like, oh, you know, it's sort of that LeBron archetype and Nick, you brought it up on the show or before the show or something about how like, that's that kind of took you aback. And it's like, I think it's just that physical dominance, that high volume ball it's, handling and driving right. to the lane, bodying whoever's inside, regardless of, you know, how well you're defended. We've type seen of energy. plenty of dudes in the NBA who are like tall enough, strong enough and athletic enough, but none of them have the handle and the speed that Paolo does. So a lot of last year I got frustration from like, man, you have the body and the skill set to replicate possibly the goat. Um, maybe do that instead of trying to be Kobe. Uh, thus far, he's been way more aggressive in terms of like not settling for the mid range shots. And I say settling because he wasn't that great at them. Like there's a difference if you're really good at them and you're taking them a lot, but he just wasn't. They've really just proven that they're they're going to go as far as Paolo goes because the rest of their team is playing okay, but their additions and the guys that are sort of at the end of the rotation who low-key make the biggest difference, whether or not they play great or play terribly, uh, they haven't been very good. KCP averaging five points a game right now. Cole Anthony averaging two points a game right now. I would, I would like to put an asterisk on something that you said, Rudy. Please. And it's that you said the rest of their team has just been okay. And I think that is massively, 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 massively underselling how good Jalen Suggs has been. Mm. Jalen Suggs, it looks like so far, like he has actually taken like another leap as an offensive player. He is attempting nearly eight threes a night so far, hitting them at a 45% clip. That's probably going to come down. Uh, that mm -hmm. makes sense. But that's up from his volume last year. Uh, where he was hitting them at an almost 40% clip. He is, the types of three-pointers that he's taking are, it is a much more diverse uh, shot selection of threes, like off screen, off the dribble, catch and shoot, like you name it. He's been taking them, he's been making them so far. And you're also getting all NBA caliber defense from him. And you're also getting like good ball handling in scoring outside of just the three-point shooting next to Paolo. And so I, I look at this and I think, not saying Jalen Suggs can be your second option next to Paolo, but for right now, he's doing a pretty good, he's in a pretty good Halloween costume of a second option next to Paolo. You know, I saw him talking shit to a fan who was making fun of his bald spot. He said, take that do-rag off. I'm talking mad shit to a guy who's like trying to insult him for his balding hair. I'm sorry, but if I'm in the NBA, I don't care if I'm balding. <laughs> I mean, I'll, 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 I'll wait to come home. I'll be the, the wacky late '80s style player who just got like the George Costanza cut. Is out there trying to dunk. Uh, if I'm in the NBA, I care a lot because I actually have the means to do something about this. <laughs> Need to go to Turkey real quick. Uh, so, so real or fake contenders? The Orlando Magic after just four games. I Let's need to believe Franz's three is back for sure before I say that, because I think that is a very key factor. Um, but otherwise, if it is, B-tier contender, but contender. Yeah, as real of a contender as you can be in a conference with the Boston Celtics. Right. Who unfortunately still look incredible. Well, I guess not unfortunately. I don't really play no, it is Boston. Isn't. Unfortunately but, yeah. for the rest of the league. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, premature extrapolation. The Suns doing quite good. They are... A decent defense, currently ranked 12th in opposing points per game and 11th in opposing field goal percentage, uh, while being 6th in their own field goal percentage, shooting 38% from 3. Kevin Durant, doing Kevin Durant things. Devin Booker's volume is a little bit down. And Dias Jones isn't exactly standing out like we expected, but alas, they got Ryan Dunn. They are 3-1, and one, and uh, that rhymes. But are the Suns as much of a threat as they could be? Mike Budenholzer is a good coach. Oh, I'm not saying Mike Budenholzer is like, you know, the best coach in the league, but Mike Budenholzer is one of those coaches that it doesn't really matter a whole lot who you have on your team. If you have like decent enough players, he is a floor raising coach. Like he is going to raise the floor of your team. You might get lucky and raise the, he might get lucky and raise the ceiling of your team too. The Suns look like drastically different. Uh, their defense right now, I think, Rudy, the number that you used is points allowed. Uh, mm -hmm. Defensive rating-wise, yeah. 
Uh, they are top five in defensive rating right now. They are allowing 108.3 points per 100 possessions, which is really freaking good. Obviously, small sample size. Yes, we're going to see how that goes through the rest of the season. But on paper, like Ryan Dunn, that's what he was drafted. I'm doing a whole video on Ryan Dunn. It should be out either tonight or tomorrow. Ryan Dunn, what he was drafted for is because he was like this Herb Jones guy who just an incredible defender. He can do a little bit of interior anchoring for you and also guard out to the perimeter. But could he shoot threes? Like, no. In college, everyone was like, yeah, you know, he's an amazing defender. Can't shoot threes. He was literally getting like Andre Roberson comps. And now he can shoot threes. And a player like that on a team like this, that, you know, they had the platform they just needed, or they had the plan, they just needed the platform. It's like they got Mike Budenholzer now, who's got them operating in a way that maximizes their strengths. Their defense looks really, really good. I've got some takes about Nurkic. I, I don't think Nurk Nurkic is going to hold them back a little bit. Um, I think they've, from I don't know what the numbers say, but my eye test says that Mason Plumley has actually probably been better than Nurkic. Yeah. Uh, but, like, this team's good. This is a good team. This is a top 10 team in the NBA, in my opinion. Yeah. I wouldn't put them in contenders until they address the center thing because I truly think it's that bad. Nurkic is, I don't know how highly he ranks among worst starters in the league, but he's in the top one percentile. He's like awful. He's horrifyingly bad. So I don't know. There's apparently they're considering shopping Grayson Allen. Who has I don't not been good like, this year. Huh? He has not been good this year. He's going like fucking three points a game or something like that. It's small sample size. Uh, it's... My thing is, I don't think you're going to get a very good center for that. As good as Ryan Dunn is, I do think they should at least consider the idea of like cashing in on him as the young asset that they have to get a center that will matter more. I, I What I'm saying is, I understand that he's good and cheap and that they were trying to stretch things as much as they can, but also because he's good and cheap, that's the best asset they have. So if you wanted to get like a really good starter... And you still have, like, Royce O'Neal, so you still got a defensive forward. I think it's worth considering. It would obviously depend on who that center is. Well, I have one, and I think both teams say no. But I want to just throw it out there. We can chew on it for a little bit. He's also not really a center. He is a power forward, but he's played center in the past. Straight up, one for one. I'm sh I believe the salaries would work. Grayson Allen for Isaiah Stewart. That's not horrible. I feel like they maybe want someone who's a little bigger. Right. That's, that's really not bad, because I feel like maybe i'm tripping but isn't Stu like an adequate enough shooter to where you have to guard him out there he's not out there just shooting wide open threes i would be curious to see how defenses would approach him in the postseason because we haven't really seen how much teams are really scared of him because there's a difference between hitting your threes and then hitting them in a way that teams actually respect you he also yeah. just doesn't get to take them anymore because that's like we actually have dudes who can shoot threes detroit says no because we still need him and also why create a log jam at the at the two spot you know what i mean with grace and yeah, allen it's know. like well we just spent a bunch of money to get malik beasley to get tim hart like we, you know what i mean so yeah. that, both teams are going to say no to it but like in a vacuum i don't know something i just say it because uh, grace and allen was high on the list for detroit in terms of guys that they wanted to go after and then grace and got extended and it was like fuck but then again, it's like, okay, well, our plan B was Tim Hardaway and Malik Beasley. So I just, I don't think it actually makes sense. I, I think we're, we're high on the Suns right now on this podcast. I, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and guess right now. The commenters are not going to be high on the Suns. With, I think this is going to be the thing that people get very up in arms about. We shall see. Uh, just a couple things left in the podcast overall. Uh, right now, we've gone through seven teams in terms of like, are they in, in a disaster state or are they uh, already contenders just through three or four games? I want to talk about a player now. Lamelo Ball. Talk about the steal of our fantasy draft, Alex. So that, that we somehow let him slide to you in like round eight or some crap like that. Like you got him so late in the draft. And yet here he is, second in the league in scoring, uh, putting up 31 and a half, seven rebounds, seven assists with a steal, almost a block. I mean, Dude is absolutely balling right now. Matt Issa got a tweet right here saying that a big reason why is that he has a uh, massive attempt. In, <laughs> that This is definitely a, a typo, but what he says literally is a massive attempt in free throw attempts, averaging over four attempts per 100 more than his previous career high. 
all the way up to 11.3 from 7.2. Lamelo getting to the line. Are we buying Lamelo as a uh, a true superstar in this league? He has fully arrived. He is demonstrating his potential. I mean, this you don't have to look at the numbers to see how good Lamelo Ball is. You watch him play, and it's like he's taking some of the highest degree of difficulty shots on some crazy high efficiency. Not even just for those shots, but just in general. The dude is hooping. So Lamelo Ball, are we are we buying? Or are we selling stock? I've been buying Lamelo Ball stock since You're... he was a rookie. It's like he was. I don't know where this idea came from, and I'm not saying anyone here like fell into this camp. But there was this off-season narrative that was floating around that like Lamelo actually sucks, guys. Like this is no better than a Colin Sexton in Cleveland empty stats player. And I'm like, I don't know how we came to that conclusion because the one fully healthy season that he's had his sophomore year, he was an all-star and the Charlotte Hornets were a 45 win team or a 40, they were a 40 plus win team, something like that, above 500 or at least 500. <laughs> so this idea that he somehow isn't good seemed to appear out of nowhere, just out of thin air. And so am I surprised that last year he played 22 games, but in those 22 games, he looked he looked awesome. He had that one stretch where he was averaging, I think it was like a five game stretch where he was averaging like 30 points per game. Here we are, he's healthy. He's had an off season. They've got some continuity. They got a good coach now. I think the coaching change is huge. I seriously, seriously, seriously think that this coaching change is huge for Charlotte. Not saying that I think Steve Clifford was bad coach, but I think their current coach, um, uh, what's Charles something? Um, Chuck I think Lee. The, yeah. Uh, he's a really good coach. I think he's doing a lot for the culture there. And I think the results are speaking for themselves with LaMelo Ball. I think he's insanely good. And this is what we've been waiting to see ever since high school, ever since middle school, when we saw him pulling up from half court. This is what we've been waiting for. And I think it's probably might be worth the wait. I will say where the the those Lamello actually suck shit comes from. I almost feel like we should come up with a term for it for like a type of player who is both really good but also volatile and their low lights look like horrifying for a player who's otherwise really good. Because and I I've seen Lamello ball play live like eight times before. He when he misses a three, he misses it badly. I don't know what that's about, but like if you watch LaMelo when he's playing poorly, you're gonna be like, oh, this is the worst player I've ever seen. Because you can like play bad, but it looks good, and then you can play bad and it looks like shit. With him, it's when he plays bad, it looks fucking awful. Um, but like all of the stats, all the advanced stats, all of that shit would suggest he's very good. The win percentage they have where he's there versus when he's not like yeah lamello lamello's good and i'm not shocked at all that he's playing really well right now what alex said about i've bought uh enough lamello stock essentially like i don't i think i'm hard capped i don't think i'm allowed to buy more lamello stock you've you've maxed out your four right, right. you can't contribute anymore i don't know if that's how stocks work maybe yeah, they do right but... right i'm just making an analogy yeah 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 your ball savings account is uh is maxed out Nick, do you have more thoughts on LaMelo Ball this season or on the wedding episode of Lovis? Uh, I've taken a back seat in a lot of these conversations because unless your team just played the Detroit Pistons, I just don't have time to watch a bunch of games. So that's why I've got nothing. I don't know. I, I read a lot about how LaMelo looks good. Uh, I don't want to be the harbinger of a uh, manifestation here. Hey, maybe Alex is right. Right? Maybe this is quote unquote what we've been waiting for all along. So what happens when he tweaks his back next month and then he's sidelined for three? You know what I mean? Like that's just kind of how this always goes. He looks fucking awesome and then he just gets hurt and he's out forever. And then we yeah. talk about how bad he is. Not we, but to Alex's point, everyone's like, oh, he fucking sucks. And then he's like, then it's to repeat the cycle. Then he starts playing and we're like, wait, this fucking guy? And then he gets hurt. So uh, love is blind. I hope somebody cries. Um, I hope somebody... Yep, that's it. Hope somebody cries. Alex, I had a really good time at my Survivor Night last week. Did did you and your grandmother-in-law enjoy seeing Rome get kicked off? I heard a lot of people didn't really like this episode because it was so yeah. predictable. 
I would like to clarify that I do not just watch Survivor with my grandmother-in-law. I am <laughs> watching it with my mother-in-law and my wife and my brother-in-law at my grandmother-in-law's house. Right, uh, just that would be odd too, if I was just... Out. Hey, what about this uh, Kendrick and Drake beef? Roll the credits. Roll the credits. Yeah, right. Y'all tune in next week for the uh, first A rookie plane report. hit the World Season. Trade Center? <laughs>